But welcome everyone for joining. Um, again, my name is Dave Simmons, Executive Director of Ride Illinois, and we have Gina Kenny as well. And you're, let me see, your Communications and Projects Specialist, right? Am I? Am I, uh, I got to check. Communications and Projects Coordinator, but okay. with only two of us, I don't know, maybe I can just change it to Professional Bike Geek. <laughs> there you go. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started today. Uh, we are gonna talk about cycling for transportation. So welcome to those that have joined us. Welcome to those that are viewing this on Facebook Live. And then uh, we will be recording this. So there'll be some folks viewing the session after the fact as well. All right, just a quick note about Ride Illinois. So those of you that, that have been on um, some of our sessions in the past have seen this slide, but do wanna talk about what Ride Illinois does and, and how we work to improve cycling um, for folks in Illinois. Uh, so actually I have, I'm going to start with a poll question just to kind of see this is a I'm going to launch this poll and so the question is have you attended any of our other seminars or webinars I should say. We'll just give <laughs> kind of threw the last one in there because you know we're all <laughs> we all have zoom zoom fatigue right. All right, I'll give it one more second. Looks like someone else is joining us. So, so this is great. Again, thanks, thanks for, for joining. Um, all right, so we're kind of split. Um, and we have one person that is just like, whose head is exploding because of so much Zoom. So thanks to those that have joined before. Thanks to those that have attended for the first time. Um, we're gonna jump right into it now. And my cat's gonna keep screaming. So I'm gonna open the door just a second. That's the, uh, the production quality right behind all this. All right, uh, so those are our goals here. These are the hosts. Um, I did change my picture. Um, the, and so this, the picture that's there now is uh, from a Jason's Deli along the Salt Creek Greenway and they have free ice cream, so I like free ice cream. And probably um, everyone might wish that we had this type of weather today. Yeah, right, <laughs> that's true, good point, good point. All right, I uh, do want to share a little bit about our, our sponsors or corporate members, I should say. Um, so we, these are some folks that have financially supported Ride Illinois, and we, we certainly appreciate their support. Um, many of whom uh, you will see at, I think that's my next slide, look at this. So the Illinois Bike Summit uh, is coming up in September. Um, I know some of the folks that are already on, on the session have, have registered, thank you very much. Um, we'd love for everyone to join us. Uh, we are doing this virtually or online, which allows us to keep the, the cost down and then reach a wider audience. So whether you're an advocate or a professional, um, there are going to be sessions, breakout sessions and, and other sessions that will pertain to you. Uh, go to uh, IllinoisBikeSummit.org and you can learn more. All right, so just some ground rules. I think uh, certainly those that have been through Zoom sessions have kind of seen these kind of things. Uh, Gina is going to monitor the Q&A in the chat. Um, do enter some questions in the Q&A. Use the chat for maybe some back and forth. Uh, we do have a few polls. I'd love for you to, to reply to, um, and hopefully you'll learn some skills and tips. And as I said earlier, we will we'll share the link um, on our website so you can either revisit or share it with others. All right, so we are talking today about cycling for transportation. Um, so riding your bike for everyday trips. And there's a couple quotes just to kind of kick things off here. And, and so this one actually came from, I don't know how well I'll do with framing this, but this really great um, Trek publication that came out recently. And I, um, I thought the, the quote was rather pertinent and there's a sense of urgency behind it. Um, in 2018, the transportation, the transportation sector was responsible for 20, over 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. So um, just to kind of frame the conversation today, there is certainly uh, uh, you know, the, an environmental bent to it. So you know, we wanna encourage people to ride for transportation and leave their, their cars at home. Um, and then one more very poignant quote, um, which yes, I did, I did just craft this last night and I, try, I tried to be you know, somewhat uh, reflective. Uh, but the picture, the reason I chose the picture in the bottom is that this was my daughter's high school graduation back in May of 2018. And it was 92 degrees, you know, it was a ceremony, it was at 10 o'clock in the morning. 
and I'm stubborn. So I did ride in shirt and tie. Um, it was just under a couple miles. So I didn't show up all sweaty, but uh, just, you know, it's one of those types of situations you may not choose to ride a bike to. All right, um, we have shared this before. And I, again, want to kind of get a pulse of folks on that are on the call today. Um, there are four types of, of cyclists as defined by a planner with Portland, Oregon. Um, so strong and fearless, which means you're willing to ride pretty much anywhere. You don't need specific infrastructure. If you're enthused and confident, um, you, know, you, you kind of like infrastructure, but you're still willing to, um, to kind of to branch out and, and ride you know, some more roads and stuff like that. Uh, the interested but concerned really means, yeah, you know what, you need to give me something. I, I need to have some infrastructure or I'm just not going to do it. And then there's folks who aren't, aren't going to ride one way or the other. So my poll question here is, how do you, how do you identify? Which, which one of these do you uh, identify with? And while you're answering, um, at the time this poll was taken, 1% of cyclists identified as strong and fearless, 7% were enthused and confident, 60% are interested but concerned. So from an advocate standpoint, that, that is typically the pool of people we're really trying to tap into, right? Because there's that, that's over half. And then 33% of people are like, eh, they're not gonna do it no matter what. So, you know, that, that, that's okay too. So just to see <clears throat> who we have on the, the call today, we've got some, some more confident riders, which is great. Um, I could probably pick out a few based on the, who I know is on the call, but I, I won't do that. So thank you for sharing. Slide that poll aside and um, we shared this in, in one of our past webinars as well. So there's lots of benefits to cycling, you know, whether you cycle for transportation <clears throat> or recreation, um, you are going to improve your health. Um, you're going to emit, you know, you're not going to emit um, greenhouse gas emissions, which is great. So you're helping the environment and the air. Um, as we'll talk today, it, it does have, certainly cycling for transportation has benefit for your finances. Um, and then the community and infrastructure kind of one in the same, right? So um, communities that have more people out on bikes tend to be um, more desirable for, you know, for people that, that are looking to move uh, into a community. Um, might, might even, you know, influence uh, the home prices. But it's also kind of a friendly way to get around. And then, of course, bikes have less, uh, less tax, and you know, that's not the best word, less wear and tear, I should say, on infrastructure. So uh, anything that does get repaired tends to last a little bit longer if there's more people biking. Okay, some health statistics, and I'm not going to read all these off. Again, we, we shared some of these in an earlier webinar, but, um, you know, pause and, and read some of those and, and just think about, you know, that, that there's some pretty pretty scary numbers there, right? And some encouraging numbers, such as the one in the middle with the 48%. And I don't think this is probably a surprise to, to anyone. So here we're gonna, we're gonna jump into, um, so again, some statistics. So the cost of owning a car, th this comes from a couple different sources. There was a, a nerd wallet, um, article and you know and the numbers are going to vary slightly depending on the source but these are some of the more consistent numbers the graphic that you see there is from aarp so it shows the the average cost of driving a car in 2017 um, and i know it's pretty small but uh, up in, in the upper left that's a small sedan six thousand three hundred fifty four dollars and the bottom right is a pickup truck it's slightly over ten thousand dollars so the average comes out to about eighty five hundred bucks to uh, to own a car and then I think we've all experienced that like sinking feeling when you drive a car, a new car off a, <laughs> off the lot and you, you know, like, all right, it's, it's already lost a bunch of value. So the figure that, that um, I was able to find was about 25%. And then that last, um, that last statistic, 16%, that's actually more than the average American spends on either housing um, or food. So we are in general, on average, we're spending a lot of money on, um, on transportation. So now we'll, we'll kind of flip the script there and talk about um, the cost of owning a bike. Uh, $400, that's a number I kind of, you know, just picked out of the air. 
Um, I think, I, I don't, I mean, you can disagree with me, but I think for $400, you can get a pretty decent bike. And then the 308 is operating costs. So maybe there's some maintenance cost, or you gotta replace some parts. Again, these numbers will vary based on the source. Um, but you know, you could save 85 bucks a year just by making a couple short trips a week by bike. Uh, and then the 4.6 billion. Um, so that's if, you know, if we didn't drive at all. <laughs> so that's a big number, not, not, not trillions like uh, national debt numbers and that, but it's still a pretty significant number. All right, so now we're gonna break this down a little bit further and just talk about where, how about per mile? You know, you, we're talking, let's imagine there was a toll booth every mile, right? Uh, so it's gonna cost you about 62 cents to drive your car. And this is gonna be fuel, it's gonna be maintenance, like everything kind of baked into it. And then about 10 cents per mile to ride a bike. So if you bike for transportation, and for every 10 miles you do that, you get you know, five, $5.20 in your pocket. Um, and then I, I love this figure though, the, the miles per gallon for a cyclist, because you, know, you have to eat more, the fuel and this and that. But anyway, the number varies widely. Um, the figures I was able to find was between 100 and, and 290 miles per gallon. So pretty darn efficient. I don't think uh, maybe like what they call them, the hyper milers or they soup up their, um, their, their, their Priuses and that, maybe they can get to that close to 100 or so. All right, now I want to talk, uh, ask a, a few questions here. So these are going to be kind of three polls right in a row. And I'm curious to, to know or to see what, what you all think about some of these questions here. So uh, you're guessing the percent of uh, US car trips within a mile of home, within two miles of home, and then um, which percent of the population commute. So I guess it probably shows them all, all three at a time. So one of these percentages is the correct percentage for each of those questions. Um, oh, there we go. People are starting to see it. Don't worry, these are all, all the polls are anonymous, so we're not, gonna, we're not gonna come after you and ask why you thought one thing or the other. But the quote on the bottom, so while you guys are filling it out, um, again, comes from this Trek magazine, as do, this, do these um, the statistics that you see here. Um, the statistics actually came from a survey in 2017 from the, at the National Household Travel Survey, which is conducted by the US Department of Transportation. So. I did uh, certainly want to find reliable and, and uh, kind of certified sources. All right, we're getting close. We'll give folks another couple seconds here and then we'll... Uh, someone isn't sure how to submit their poll answer. But I think once you click all of your choices, you should be able to hit submit. I think if, my guess is if you well, only welcome. pick choices for two of them, maybe that's why it's not showing up. That could be. So we'll give you another sec if, if that was you who asked the question. Sorry if it's if you're not able to vote. He's good. OK, great. OK, so. Oh, and someone else pointed out you have to scroll down because we had so many. There you go. So he, here's the answers. And again, kind of pause and think about this, right? So 17% of car trips are within a mile of home. Um, if, if my kids were on here, they, they, they could. Uh, verify this, but um, if, if something's close by, I tend to say, I could somersault there, right? And these, these are like somersaultable trips, right? I mean, you can literally, or skip or however, right? It's not gonna take you that long. 41% um, within two miles. And then 48% uh, of the population commutes less than five miles. Now, this of course is not taking into account the type of job you have or what you have to bring or carry, but these are just sheer numbers, right? So. My, my question or my, my next statement to you is just imagine if say half of those trips, so maybe only nine and a half percent of car trips, uh, no, sorry, eight and a half, check my math, um, were made, or trips less than an hour were made by car and you know 20%, that's a huge chunk. So that's from, again, from an advocate's perspective, that's where we wanna start. We wanna get people thinking differently that they don't just have to hop in their car. Sorry, and I don't believe I shared that. So I just shared the results now. All right, so you guys did well on the first question with almost half of you getting it right again. These are, it's just to frame the conversation. 
All right, so I'm going to put that aside. And I went back and forth on this slide. Again, I'm not going to read all of them. This is, think of it as a mindset. Okay, so I'm going to, you know, choose an example here. So a recreational cyclist may um, feel like they have to carve time out of their day to go for a ride. Like this is, this is my workout, right? Or as someone who's riding for transportation, it's like, a, I got to go here. I got a bike. I'm going, you know, you know, it just kind of becomes part of how they get around. Um, and then let's see, uh, just to call out one other one, you know, weather. So if someone's riding for recreation and, you know, there's a chance of rain and maybe they're trying to get to work or, you know, or I'm sorry, if they're riding for kind of pleasure for recreation, they might say, well, you know, I'll wait till the rain passes or I'll ride later. Whereas if you're riding for transportation, as long as it's not terrible weather, you might be more prone to just jump out and go for it. So again, just, just mindsets. And I know that um, many folks ride for recreation and transportation, um, but this is trying to kind of just compare the two. Um, and one other thing um, to note is that, that those that ride for, for transportation, um, this is somewhat anecdotal, I don't have a source for this, but uh, tend to be safer drivers just because they're less concerned maybe about speed or heart rate or whatever it might be and they're just like getting places. So I know it is, has made me a, a better, better driver. All right, so what are we gonna to discuss today? We're gonna to jump into some of these topics here. Um, no need to necessarily focus too much on that, but we're gonna start with, so where do I begin? Let's say, you know, you've, you've not ridden for transportation you know, you're, in, you're part of that 60% who are interested but concerned. Um, so we would recommend that you choose somewhere close by. You know, the photo here shows someone who went to the grocery store. So instead of saying, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm gonna start commuting to my job and it's 15 miles away and you know, jump into it and go for it, more power to you if, if you do, but let's start small. And then of course, know your limits. Uh, not only your physical limits, but the limits of of in this example, what can you carry on your bike? Um, and then ask yourself the question, can I bike there? So before you go somewhere, just, you know, maybe that's your knee jerk reactions. Hey, can I bike there? Um, there's a great documentary and maybe great's a little strong. I want to put this in the chat. Um, the documentary is called Bicycle Revolution. And that's actually where that, that quote came from because there's a scene in there where, um, it's a bunch of college students and this, woman, this young woman asks or says that that's how she started to to kind of frame things like hey can I bike there and if the answer was yes she'd figure out a way to do it so I just put it in the chat I did see it's available on Amazon Prime so if anyone has Amazon Prime you can watch it um, otherwise it's you can rent it for five bucks off Vimeo and then just know that when it comes to a route, the route you choose or you, you take by bike, it's going to be most likely going to be different and it might be a little bit further. And I'll show an example later on where the route is actually a little bit shorter. But you want to be safe. You want to be comfortable, right? You're not, this is, this is a utilitarian, you know, I'm getting somewhere for a, for a reason and I'm coming home. So make sure you're safe and make sure you're comfortable and enjoy the accomplishment. Um, I do have a, a trailer that I'll take to the grocery store and I can't tell you how many times someone will come up to me and say, wow, you know, how do you do that? Or you know, how, we, how did you start doing that or whatever? Right? Try to encourage others to, to give it a shot. Um, it, it's, it's kind of fun when, when someone stops you and, and wants to know a little bit more. All right, choosing a route. Um, so there's lots of different tools, right? If you're going close to home, you probably know a route. Um, Maybe a little bit further, maybe you need some assistance from, say, Google Maps. Um, there's lots of community bike routes, bike maps out there that will show uh, safe routes or safer routes for cyclists. Um, several of the sources, right? Talk to other cyclists, go to your bike shop. But again, this, you know, if you're riding for transportation, you're running trips and, and, and errands, you, you probably have an idea. But again, it may be different than the route you would take uh, in your car. So I have uh, the one example I wanted to share here. And hopefully this is, the, the idea is, you know, hopefully the idea is conveyed. So I just picked a spot in Elk Grove where I live, um, Grove Junior High School. So, you know, I'm kind of a big kid. So 
I went from the junior high school to the Lego store that's over by Woodfield Mall. And the picture on the left shows uh, it's what about 4.3 miles to drive there. Uh, Arlington Heights to Higgins Road, boom, you know, you're there. But hey, if you go by bike, you get to go through Bussy Woods, you know, you get to go past some lakes and wildlife, and then, you know, the last stretch of it is, is pretty similar. Um, so this was done just with Google Maps, switching between the, the driving directions and the biking directions. So easy, it's a great resource. Uh, all right, so now let's talk about bikes. So, you know, what bike is right for me? Do I need a special bike if I'm gonna go somewhere um, for transportation? You really don't, right? So any of the bikes that are shown here, which we did show this slide in, a, in an earlier webinar, can be used for, for transportation, right? And there's gonna be um, limits to some types versus others, but you know, if you just need to go somewhere, especially if you don't have to, if you're not looking to, to, you know, to buy something, maybe you run into the library or meeting a friend for lunch, every one of these bikes will work just fine. Um, you wanna make sure your bike fits you. So if this is something new and you haven't uh, been riding for a while, you know, there are some, some key things, seat height, for example, you know, you don't want your knees to be uh, bending too much or your legs straightening too far. You know, I'm not going to get into the details of, of bike fit. Just make sure it's the right size bike for you. So our ABC quick check, again, shared this in past webinars, but it's you're checking the air in your tires to make sure that they're properly inflated. You're checking your brakes by standing next to the bike, uh, squeezing the brakes and kind of pushing it forward, making sure it stops. You're checking your, your chain and your crank and your cassette, the whole drivetrain of the bike to make sure it runs smoothly. So just a quick brief check to make sure that your, your bike is running smoothly. And then if you need additional help after that, take it to a bike shop, you know, maybe get a tune up every couple of years, just make sure that, uh, that your bike is running smoothly. And then oh, just and Dave, quick, I'll, sorry, yeah. I'll interject that we do have a list of local bike shops and a map on our website and Terry, just before you did, had made a tip to go to your support your local bike shop. Excellent point. Yeah, Gina, maybe if you get a chance, um, maybe you could throw that link in the chat. If not, it is on our website. So yeah, so where to buy a bike. If you buy from a local bike shop, you're more likely going to, you might spend a little more, but you're going to get a, have a better experience and you're going to get a, a bike that, that is, um, you know, properly fit and, and is meant for how you plan to use it. But again, any, any bike really that's in decent shape will do. All right, um, you may have heard about cargo bikes, right? Cargo bikes are awesome. You know, these are just two examples that I found while doing some searching. Um, they're pretty expensive. So certainly not something you wanna jump into. Um, you know, maybe you're one of those people who are gonna sell their second car, get a cargo bike, you know, an e-cargo bike, and you know, this whole lifestyle change. Uh, great, if you can do that, but uh, you don't need to jump in with both feet right away. So you can always purchase something like that later. All right, so do you have to wear a helmet? Um, you don't have to, there's no laws, no state laws that require you to wear a helmet. Um, if you use, if you were to use, say the Cook County Forest Reserves, if you're under four, 14 and under, you do need to wear a helmet. Um, but yeah, you, you, you don't have to, but we highly recommend it. Um, I brought my helmet in. I had plans of doing this outside on my, my balcony where we could still get good Wi-Fi connection, but it's, it's pretty hot out there. <laughs> um, so I brought my helmet in here and thought I'd just do a quick, quick check of the helmet or quick helmet fitting here. Um, so you wanna make sure that in general it fits, fits your head. Um, we, we refer to eyes, ears, and mouth. So eyes, make sure that you can kind of see the lip of the helmet here, that it's level on your head. The ears, make sure the straps come to a Y or a V underneath the ears and then the chin looks like this is a little loose a couple fingers that go underneath that and then i've got a little dial in back that i can kind of do some fine tuning so make sure your your helmet's properly fit make sure it has the certifications which i've never seen a helmet in a store that does not um, but that just means it's safe to use and then replace it after some people say five years some say seven years um, certainly if you crash and hit your head, it's a good time to replace it. And then you're helping to set an example for, you know, the, the other adults and the kids that you see out on the road. 
Um, let me pause real quick. Gina, any questions that we should address now? Uh, yes. So in fact, um, I can, somebody just asked how does a chain, how often does the chain need to be lubed or take it into the bike shop for that? And what I was typing, but I can just say is um, that varies a lot depending on how much you're riding and if you're riding on dry pavement or a wet surface. So I usually will run my finger along the chain. Um, if it's dry, I add some. You do want to wipe it off first. And then after you put lube on, you want to wipe off any excess sheets that I just take it to my bike shop. You'd be going into your bike shop pretty frequently for that. Yeah. But um, your bike shop is a great place that can recommend the type of lube for the type of riding you're doing as well as you can tell them how much you're riding, where you're riding, and they can give you some um, good recommendations about how frequently to do that. Great, thank you, Gina. Anything else that we should address now? That was it so far. Okay. Um, sorry, somebody said they can't see you though. They can't see me, well. So I think if you hover your mouse over where the uh, there's part. a speaker panel, that might help, because I, I can see him, I know. As long as you can hear, it's not that exciting seeing me. Um, but yeah, as long as you can hear. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, keep the questions coming. I wanna make sure that um, either if you, know, if you have something because your experience like Charlie or Terry, you have something you wanna share, um, please do. Because obviously we're written on some high points, but there's some things that aren't gonna be captured in here. So let's talk about what you should wear. Um, so you should wear your Ride Illinois t-shirt, right? So that's, that's what I'm wearing. Now Gina's got hers on too. I have Thank cargo you. shorts on. You know, this is the type of clothing that I'm gonna wear if I'm riding for transportation. Um, actually, almost <laughs> almost all the time, right? So I, um, I don't wear a whole lot of Lycra and jerseys and things like that. Um, I, I tend to wear baggy shorts and, and a t-shirt. Um, so you wanna be comfortable. Most of the, the transportation trips are going to be a little bit shorter, so you certainly don't need to have special bike clothing for, for something like that. Um, dress for the weather. This uh, I found this photo is from New York City, um, and it was after the, the pandemic started, and so tra transit lines were shut down. And, and you can see the people in the photo are your average, you know, your average Joe, right? Your average Dave. They're wearing jeans and they're wearing winter jackets and gloves. Um, dress for, you know, to, to be comfortable. You don't want to either be overly dressed or underdressed. Obviously brighter colors are going to be more visible, but you know, in this case, it's, it's a, you know, specific bike infrastructure. So visibility is not as much of a concern as compared to if you're out on the roads and then factor in the distance. So, you know, the gentleman coming at us with the jeans and the winter jacket, you know, maybe he's only riding two, three miles to get to work. If he's riding, 10, 12 or more, yeah, you might dress differently. <clears throat> and then be, pre be prepared for your destination. And so what I brought today, um, pretty relevant is, you know, face covering. So if I'm going to a grocery store or, you know, restaurant or library, I'll have my face covering. I have a, a little bottle. It's one of those little tra travel shampoo bottles that I just filled with hand sanitizer. Um, and in the example, the photo we see here, you know, it's colder weather. I don't know about all of you guys, but my nose drips it's like a runny faucet. So when I get somewhere, I tend to have you know tissue or a napkin, something I can use, so I'm not sniffling the entire time. So just know when you get there, you're gonna it, it, it's a break in the ride, right? Assuming you're you're heading back home, and then I tend to bring a like an old t-shirt or a rag if it's warmer out, so I can use that to kind of. And sorry, I'm going to interrupt for those that can see us. My son just came by wearing um, last year's Gibbet t-shirt. Nice. For a little appearance. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> All right. Um, so, you know, what to bring with you. And this, this isn't necessarily for just riding for transportation, right? These are things you, you might bring with you. You should bring with you at least most of these for any ride. So your ID, you know, in case something does happen. Um, oh, and your, your health insurance card, I forgot to put that in there. A cell phone, again, if you need to call someone or maybe you're meeting with friends and hey, I'm running late, I got stuck by a freight train. Or again, if, you know, if something were to happen, um, you know, a water bottle, a ride in a water bottle, of course, would be best, but this works as well because you might be thirsty even on, you know, on short trips. Um, the spare inner tube, if you're comfortable changing a tire. 
again, for a short trip, maybe you get a flat and you're calling home or calling a friend, but it's, it's important to have there. And if you're going to shop, you're going to buy something, obviously you're going to need cash and, uh, and or credit card. More and more, it's going to be credit cards. People are <laughs> tend to be veering away from cash a little bit, right? And if I can add, sometimes it's good to bring the spare inner tube because even if you don't know how to change it, there's a lot of times a good Samaritan will help you out. But if you don't have a tube with all the different wheel sizes, uh, they're probably not going to have the same size tube as you. Good point. Yeah, maybe you can be that good Samaritan for the person who happens to bring you with them. All right, and then some accessories. Uh, we mentioned the spare inner tube kind of goes hand in hand with the pump or a CO2 cartridge. Again, if you're comfortable or if you have hopes, maybe you're riding on you know, a, a route that has a lot of cyclists, someone can help you out. The multi-tool for some adjustments and then a headlight and tail light. Um, I, I do, I have a, a white, you know, we want a white front headlight and a red tail light. Um, again, because a transportation cyclist may not be always riding, you know, when it's sunny and, and out, you might be riding at night or at dusk or at dawn, you wanna be visible. Um, so I ride all the time with a, a white front headlight that's flashing, even you know, flashing in the daylight and then of course steady at night and then the red light and back. I actually have on my helmet, and I won't, I won't attempt to blind you, but this is like a little $30 rechargeable Bontrager blinker. So that, you know, that helps. And then of course you want to have a lock. So I, I bought this lock years ago. It's not one of the old ones that you could open with a ballpoint pen, um, but I, 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 this lock goes with me everywhere because oftentimes I am riding for, for transportation. So I wanna be able to make sure I lock my bike up. And we're gonna talk about locks in just a second. So just uh, yeah, a few, few tips there. Um, there you go, how should you lock up your bike? I got this information from Kryptonite and I thought it was an, a nice summary of what to think about when you're locking up your bike. Um, there is a video here. I'm not gonna play the video, but I'll put it in the chat. It's a little two minute video that, um, that shares a, a good um, information again, based on these points here. So choose a lock that's gonna be secure enough for where you're going. Um, there are certainly more secure locks than this U-lock. They actually make locks now with alarms built in. Who knew? Um, Abus has a, a really cool lock that kind of folds out like one of those old, call them old time uh, uh, tape measures. You know, my dad always had them. You know, so there's lots of different locks on it. But you want to have one that is secure for where you're going. Um, <clears throat> a lot of brands will rate their locks like on a scale of 1 to 10 or 1 to 15. Um, and also keep in mind how long is your bike going to be out there. Um, you want to lock your bike um, to a, a solid object that can't be lifted. Um, there was a, a few incidents a couple of years ago now where um, thieves would pull up like stop signs or road signs and then put them back in the ground and then once someone would lock their bike to it they would just simply pull the sign out and take the bike. So make sure that whatever you're securing to is locking to is secured in the ground and in a well-lit area um, that has a lot of foot traffic is ideal. Uh, and then uh, so lock according to value. What that means is you want to lock your, your frame, not the value as compared to other bikes, but the value of your bike. The frame for sure, the rear wheel, um, and ideally you'd get the front wheel as well. The photo here shows a, a lock. Um, it's a U-lock kind of integrated with a cable lock, so it allows you to get the front wheel. Um, if you don't have that, or like on mine, I, it just doesn't reach, I lock up my frame and my rear wheel. Uh, make sure it's tight. Um, the fewer, the less space in between the bike and whatever securing to, means it's gonna be tougher for a, a potential thief to, to get in there and either cut or, or saw through it. Um, and this one, position your lock off the ground with the keyhole facing down. I think that was just a, like a, another deterrent. Um, I don't know how critical that is, but all to be, all, you know, all, in the end, we just want to make sure that uh, your, your bike is locked properly. So I'm going to launch another poll here and I want to see, I'd like to know what kind of, uh, what kind of lock you own. Now, this is a, you don't, you don't only pick one. So if, if you have multiple locks, maybe choose the one you use most often. Oh, and 
Dave, I think your YouTube link may have just gone to panelists as opposed to everyone. Oh. <laughs> gotcha. Because I realized I did that with the bike shop list. Oh, uh, yes. All panelists. And oh, equipment. and Terry points out to know your serial number for your bike, which does help if your bike is similar. Yeah. Right. Certain communities will, um, you know, register bikes in that, which is great. Uh, we do have a question. Why is securing your rear wheel more important than your front? I well, would say you want to secure both, but I'll let you answer this. Yeah, the, well, again, based on what Kryptonite was saying is it's based on value. So a rear wheel costs more. That that's I think it's that, you know, that, that was the distinction. It's also more difficult to get off. So, you know, kind of do what makes sense for you. All right, so the poll here, we've got... Uh, Two thirds of the folks that voted um, have a cable lock and then some others have a U-lock. Um, cable locks are nice because they tend to be longer. Uh, you, you can uh, you have more ability to, to secure those to different items and then U-locks do tend to be more secure. Um, but the point here is make sure you, you know, you're locking your bike up. I've heard plenty of stories of folks who say, yeah, I just stepped in for a second and I came back out and it was gone. So want to avoid those stories of woe. All right, so now you, if you're using your, your bike for transportation, um, you're likely going to have to haul stuff at some point, right? Um, I brought in an example here of, you know, your simple string bag. These work great. You know, maybe you're going to the library and checking out a book or you're going to you know, farmer's market. Uh, give, me, give me other examples. You know, it's just somewhere simple and, and you, know, you don't need to haul a lot of stuff. You're just picking a few things up. Maybe you're carrying a change of clothes. Something like a string bag would work great. Um, the frame bag <clears throat> and trunk bag, you know, you go to any bike shop, you're going to find dozens of, of different options, right? So, you know, depending on your type of bike and what you're going to be carrying, you're going to find something that will work for your situation. Um, the panniers, so the upper the picture in the upper right, um, my little folding bike decked out with uh, all sorts of stuff, has a little rack on back and the panniers fit great. Um, and then to haul more stuff, you can get things like a cargo trailer. And actually the one photo on the bottom left is a, um, it's, it was a kid's trailer, right? And for many years I did the same thing. The kids outgrew it, but it was still functional. So yeah, groceries fit and they don't cry. So it's, it's your added bonus. Um, and we got the girl with the backpack in the bottom right, but, um, any creative do it yourself solutions that you guys wanted to share and we could, uh, and also um, unmute you if you if you wanted you can like raise your hand. Oh, uh, someone wants to know how much do cargo trailers cost? And I'll say I don't know about the cargo trailers, but I know the kid trailers vary wildly. But the one I got for like three hundred bucks when my now fourteen year old was born was hmm. used to transport him, transport other stuff, and now my niece is using it for her child. Yeah, and, and I would add, it tends to be another thing, to, you know, if you can afford a little bit more, you're going to get a better quality um, trailer that might last a little longer. Um, the one that I used, they had with the kids, I think was, you know, maybe a hundred bucks and it, it worked fine for many years. And then the one I've got now is, um, it's a Burley trailer, which I think was closer to like 300. Uh, but that's a um, great, look at garage sales you know, or look at Facebook pages because most people, when their kids outgrow the trailer, they're like, all right, I'm done with it. Who wants it? So you might be able to find a good deal that way. And uh, we had a question, probably a good idea to keep your hauling weight lower to the ground. And that kind of, there's pluses and minuses. If it's heavy, yes. But of course the trailer is sometimes a little bit harder to maneuver. Right. Sometimes like, you know, pulling a parachute. All right, excellent. Good input. So let's talk traffic laws here. Uh, again, this is a slide we shared earlier. Um, the Illinois Vehicle Code um, basically says the traffic laws that apply to cyclists, right? So that's, you'll see in, in a, I think maybe the next slide, I will talk about you know, driving your bike, right? The idea is you're gonna, you're gonna ride the same way you drive. Um, exceptions would be things like riding on an interstate. You know, your cyclists are not allowed on interstates in Illinois, out west. If it's the only way to get somewhere, you can. But um, yeah, there, there there are some exceptions. Just know that the majority of things that you would do in your car, you're going to do on your bike as well. 
Um, riding on the sidewalk, unless there's a local ordinance, is perfectly fine. You do need to, um, to yield to pedestrians if you encounter a pedestrian on the sidewalk. So we're not saying you have to ride on the road, just you, you, know, you need to be um, conscious and aware of, of pedestrians you might encounter. And there's lots of laws. Ride Illinois has, has worked on this for many, many years. The laws to protect cyclists, the three foot passing law, um, the ability to pass for a motorist to pass on a double yellow, uh, to pass a cyclist that is, and, and cross over the double yellow. Um, even things like saying you can have a rear red, red reflector or a rear red blinker, you know, kind of nuanced things, but those are the types of things that, that Ride Illinois has been working on um, to both protect uh, cyclists and you know, to make sure that motorists are um, less inconvenienced, I guess would be a good way to say it. And then know that you, you do represent all cyclists when you're out there. So um, we don't want you to do things that are gonna either endanger others or um, you know, enrage others. <laughs> we, wanna, we wanna be a, a model cyclist. And there is a, a bike law webinar on our website if you wanted to learn more. Uh, Brendan Kevinitis, one of our, our corporate members, was kind enough to come and, and, uh, and run a webinar, answer a bunch of questions, so you can certainly learn more about the laws. All right. Um, quickly, I want to talk about the smart cycling philosophy. So those that are on the line that are league cycling instructors are familiar with this. Um, but what it says is that cyclists are best when they act and are treated as drivers of, drivers of vehicles. So going back to what I mentioned earlier, this is the foundation of uh, the League of American Bicyclists program. That's what LAB stands for. And again, the idea is to drive your bike. That you are a vehicle and you should do the same things that you would do in your car. I can't tell you how many times when either speaking with someone or um, teaching a class where someone comes up to me and says, so I was in this situation and da, 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 da. what would you do? Like, what would you do as a cyclist? And, you know, 95 times out of a hundred, the answer, I, I will look back to that individual and say, well, what would you do if you're driving? What would you do if you're in a car? And it's kind of like this, ah, a little light bulb goes off. So that's the idea is uh, more often than not, you're doing the same thing. Communicate with hand signals as the woman in the photo is doing. Be visible, you know, be predictable. Um, don't hug the curb. Um, you want to be uh, riding in the distance from the curb that is practicable or, and, and safe. And then there's a lot of information on the League of American Bicyclists site. That link below, uh, bikeleague.org slash ride smart videos and, and documents and all sorts of great information. So it's a, it's a really wonderful resource. So let's talk uh, about some of the barriers. Uh, I put transportation in, cycle, in, in parentheses because these barriers apply to just about um, any cyclist. And the old and wise Kermit the Frog once said, it's not easy being green, right? So trying to be, be green and use our bike for transportation. So what might, um, what might, might get in the way of that? Um, so simply time, you know, maybe you're in a hurry. It, it will oftentimes take longer to ride somewhere than to drive. And, and I bring these up because you don't have to, you know, it's not saying you, you know, I'm going to ride everywhere. Like some people are, are that, you know, that, that determined, but um, know that if you can't ride somewhere because of any of these things, it's okay. <laughs> you know, make an effort, start again, start small um, and, and don't beat yourself up. Maybe not a time, maybe like the photo in the upper right here, um, which was a, a couple weeks back and I was heading into this. Yeah, maybe the weather's an issue. <laughs> not the greatest decision, but you know, I was already out and had to head home. And uh, it was a great photo. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. It was kind of a sinking feeling, which I'm going to guess many of you have had. Uh, photo in the upper left is infrastructure. So this was actually in, uh, I want to say it was North Lake. So either an incomplete, um, network or perhaps I think it might have gone from a business to not um, um, incorporated sorry that's the word I'm looking for it's kind of the road to nowhere right so that's that's an issue right so whether it's this case like a side path or maybe it's a bike lane ending maybe it's pavement that's you know breaking up infrastructure is something that is a huge barrier 
um, perception. So there is a perception out there that uh, if you're riding your bike, you're either poor or you've lost your license. Perception to some people. You know, I don't, I don't let that bug me. If, if that's what folks want to feel like I'm a second class citizen because I'm riding my bike. Um, I feel just the opposite. I, I kind of feel sorry for the people that are driving. <laughs> so, so don't, again, don't let that slow you down. Motorists, um, you know, some, a very few, a few people will either yell and get on the sidewalk or maybe honk their horn. It can be scary. It could cause a crash. I totally get it. What I ask of you is think about, you know, the other 10, 50, 100 people you, motorists you encountered who were, you know, perfectly safe and gave you the space and, you know, were, were conscientious. So don't always focus on kind of the, the negatives. Maybe you're, you know, you're going to a wedding or you've got a, you know, an interview or a, an important meeting, right? Yeah, if it's summertime and you don't want to show up all, all sweaty, again, that's okay. But if you're just heading to work and it's a regular old day, maybe there's an option to ride there. And then depending on what you either are bringing or are planning to, to bring home, you have to keep that in mind as well. So um, the photo on the bottom left are Christmas gifts in, the, in my trailer. So I, I did bring some Christmas gifts by bike. Um, not, not everybody's got a trailer, I get that. Um, but I will say that when one bikes somewhere for transportation or for shopping, you tend to have a smaller bill because you can only haul so much stuff home. So maybe an added I'm something benefit. I'm gonna bring up two things. One, uh, the front, the baskets that can go in the front of your bikes, one, they will affect your steering a little, but you do need to pay attention to the weight limits. I once went to the library with my son and found out how many books were too many. And we also had a comment which um, about an increase in complaints about a lot of people using a, a trail. So I just want to point that we're going to discuss our bike safety quiz later on. But I think that is that's happening for both recreational and transportation cyclists. We have a lot more people out there, which is a good thing. But there's also a lot of people that don't quite yet know all the rules of the road and the common courtesies. Right. Um, to help that out but Dave will be um, there is a slide coming up I believe later yes. on that will discuss our bike safety quiz which has a lot of helpful information for both motorists and uh, cyclists on how to better share the road or the trail yeah and I'll just add to that in general um, you know we want to be encouraging to people who are maybe getting back to it or, or maybe riding for the first time so kind of like it you know the 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 mindset a motorist might have when they see a cyclist on the road, like, oh, I gotta slow down now. That's okay. That's okay. We're not, you know, none of us are going to the Tour de France and winning prize money. Um, don't worry about your Strava segments, things like that. Like, it's okay. Let's encourage these people. Let, we wanna see them out there again. All right. Um, yeah, so just a few more talk about cycling on trails. Um, Trail etiquette is kind of the, the idea that some trails do have laws, they're hard to enforce. Um, so by doing some of these things, you know, if a trail is part of your commute or a trail it will get you to the Lego store as we saw earlier, you know, make sure that you're, you're being conscientious. Um, and as the last bullet point says, don't be that guy. I encountered that guy the other day and ugh, just drives me crazy that he's out there endangering others. Uh, and then when riding on the roads, um, we want to obey the laws, okay? We want to read beyond the headlines. And what that means is if you see on the news, you're reading the paper that a cyclist was injured you know, or killed, um, find out why. Don't just, you know, too many people then will say, well, cycling is not safe. That's so not true. Statistics show that, you know, it, it, just about every cyclist arrives at their destination or arrives back home. So let, let that be kind of a learning, uh, a learning opportunity and, and don't just chalk it up. Uh, we talked about the smart cycling philosophy. Um, the term practicable means you know, that as far right as is safe to do so, not as far right as possible. So oftentimes um, the easy way to do that is think about where a car, um, they're, they're right, the tires on the right side of the car would be. 
So you're several feet away from a curb in that case. Um, keeps you safe, keeps you away from debris and causes those that want to pass you to have to go around you. Um, some crash prevention skills. Um, so control your bike, follow the rules of the road, uh, be conscious of your lane position, uh, avoid others' mistakes. And then even if you do all those things, there will be times you're going to crash. So make sure you're wearing a helmet, maybe wear some gloves on your hands and so you don't scuff up your hands. Uh, but again, don't be that guy. But I have a, a question for you from our bike safety quiz. I want to test your knowledge here. This will be the last of the poll questions. So the image that you see on this slide, the question is, rank how visible these cyclists are to motorists at intersections from most visible to least visible. I just launched that so you can read it again. So you got one, two, three, and four from a visible. Uh, Dave, we can't see the image though. How about maybe bring. Oh yeah. It's... Oh, sorry. My polls was just over that. Never mind. Now I see it. Okay. And these are the types of questions that you're going to encounter on bike safety quiz. All right. So we got about a third of folks voting. This is a, definitely a thought provoking question. So take a little bit of time here. get over 50%. Get one. There we go. There's 50%. All right. So just in the interest of time, I'm going to end the poll and share the results here. So the correct answer is um, the fourth answer. So 2143. Uh, so um, because number two and one are riding with the flow of traffic, that's the key there. That's where motorists are going to expect to see people. Three and four are riding against the flow of traffic, less visible. Um, three, a little bit more visible simply because they're on the side path or the sidewalk here. So hopefully that was a thought provoking question. Uh, congrats to the, the four of you get, that got that correct. Um, and we did have a, a question, but it's going to take a little bit more um, research on my part. Uh, if we could list the fatalities and why on the website. I think mm -hmm. we may have that actually somewhere on our website, but obviously not obvious enough, but I will uh, check into that and make sure. Otherwise I know places like League of American Bicyclists also do, but you're right. We should have kind of, and I'm not sure if you're talking about like the common types of fatalities and injuries, um, but of course a lot of that is on bike safety quiz as well, but go ahead, Dave. Yeah. So, well, good segue, bike safety quiz. So um, if you've taken it before, take it again, if it's been a while. Um, if you've never taken it, take it. Take the adult cyclist, take the motorist quiz. It's free. Uh, unless you choose to get a, a certificate, you won't get any email from us. Um, but there's lots of thought-provoking questions like the one you just saw on bike safety quiz. Uh, if you've got young kids, have to take the child cyclist quiz. Um, it, this has been translated to Spanish recently, and we also have downloadable PDF versions. So this is uh, Ride Illinois, um, really our key educational resource that allows us to get some information to lots of people. Um, and by lots of people, it's over 110,000 folks have taken this. Um, and we're actually starting to, uh, to share this with other, other states as well. So we're, we're really getting the word out. And then just a, a couple final things, and I, I do not have a hard stop at one, so I you know, could certainly continue with questions, but there's some organizations that are working to make biking for transportation and recreation better, um, including those that are listed here. It ranges from a national organization you know, all the way down to your local club or advocacy organization. And then for how can you support Ride Illinois? You know, attending this webinar is a great idea great way to show your interest and support. Um, we just want you to ride. We want you to ride frequently for both recreation and transportation. And, and again, don't be that guy. Um, take the quiz, um, contact us. You know, you can reach us on, on social media. You can reach us via email at the bottom right corner is our kind of our general email address. Um, if you like what we do, become a member. Um, you know, the more members and followers we have, the more people we can reach out to. So with that, we have some time for questions. And Gina, maybe you can 
see if we have any other questions or comments or if again if anybody wanted to speak instead of type just raise your hand and we'll unmute you so far i think we've answered all of them but yes this is a great time of course for people to ask some more i see in the chat there's talking uh charlie mentioned be mindful of the time of day when trails are busiest also keep in mind that um, many trails are, are closed after dusk which is not something that you know we, we've we've tried the organization has tried to to make some inroads there but have not been successful as of yet um, yep share the trail over as you gina yes <laughs> all right well then um you know thanks for everybody uh, who joined again let's let's keep in touch um, if you have a topic that is would be of interest to others um, or a topic you'd like to present on, we'd be happy to have you. Uh, we, can, we can use uh, kind of our Zoom account and the platform to, to help get the word out. Um, you know, we want to interact with our members and collaborate. So um, yeah, we, we, we appreciate you guys being here and uh, let us know if you're just getting into some transportation cycling, send us some pictures or send us a, a summary of, of how it went because <laughs> they those are always great stories to hear. Uh, and I have to specifically call out Chris Pranger. Thank you. My brother-in-law joined. Hopefully the kids are with you. Andrew, Catherine, if you're there. Hello, hello. All right. If there's nothing else, then I think we'll wrap up. But again, thanks. Um, and uh, if you're out this weekend, as Mr. Witt always says, drink before you're thirsty, eat before you're hungry, because it's going to be, it's going to be a scorcher. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Gina. We'll see you at the next webinar. Bye -bye.